Now, let me ask you if you would to take out your message notes from inside your bulletin. It looks like this. And also, if you have your Bible, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5 this morning, verses 15 through 17. We're going to skip around a little bit today, but our main text will come from Ephesians. And I uh, just want to tell you, you know, it's been a, a, a few weeks since I've preached to you. Uh, I preached a couple of weeks ago before Christmas, but uh, I... I I'll be honest with you, I've been saving up for this morning, all right? Uh, I hope you didn't make any lunch plans because I am, I am rearing, I don't even know what that means, but I am rearing and I'm ready to go. So just uh, sit back, buckle up, and, and get yourself ready because I'm, I'm ready to preach. Every year, every, every year about this time, I guess over the last few weeks especially, most of the major news magazines put out an issue with a special pictorial section recalling people and events that made news during the previous year. And of course, we, we see the same thing on the internet, but if you've been in a grocery store line or a Walmart line, you've probably seen some of these magazines, kind of an end of the year review kind of thing. And many of the magazines also include articles by experts predicting what they expect to see happening in the years ahead. Now, I'm always interested in that ever since I was a kid. I always thought that was neat to kind of look into the future and, and kind of guess what the future might be like. Some of these uh, stories even go so far as to make long-range predictions covering from 10 to 20 years in the future. Now, a few of these predictions have, have proven amazingly accurate while others couldn't have been more wrong. For example, back in 1967, experts predicted that by the year 2000, technology would have taken over so much of the work that we do that the average American work week would be only 22 hours long. Right? Amen? And, and that we would, only, we would work only... Now I'm not, we would work 27 weeks a year. Think about that. 27 weeks a year. Now, as a result, one of our biggest problems, this story said, they were predicting, would be in deciding what to do with all our leisure time, right? Like, what are we, what are we going to do with all of our off time? Now, I don't know how many of you are going to get 25 weeks of vacation this coming year, but I'm going to guess that that prediction probably missed its mark just a, a little bit, uh, even 15 years after the year 2000. The, re the reality is nearly 50 years after that prediction was made, Life, at least for me, and I think it's true for you, life seems more busy, not less so. I mean, we're always in a hurry. We walk fast, we talk fast, we eat fast, and then we, we, we stand up and say, you're going to have to excuse me, i got to run, right? I, I was on vacation this week, I had the opportunity to play golf with Marty McBee, all right? I played golf with Marty McBee and with Calvin McGee. And I don't know if you guys know Marty McBee and Calvin McGee, but I played the fastest round of golf in human history. There were multiple times when I would hit my ball and think, now that's, that's, a, that's a pretty good shot, only to hear the cart starting up and taking off without me. I, and I would have to run and jump into the cart while it's moving like the Duke's a hazard. To, be, to make sure I didn't get left behind before the, the next hole that was going to happen. We, that, but that's kind of how we live our life, is it not? We live life at a breakneck pace. And, and so as we begin 2015, you know, I wonder how are we going to do this year in terms of our time? Will we be as busy as we were last year? Will we make any better use of our time? In 361 days, when it's all over, Will we be looking back with joy or will we be looking back with more regret? Will we be looking at, at the future with anticipation or with dread? Well, there's a passage of Scripture that I believe can, can kind of help us as we look forward to the rest of 2015. It's Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 17. As I mentioned to you, it's written by the Apostle Paul. It's written to some Christians in the city of Ephesus. And here is what the Apostle Paul says to them about their future. He says this, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. This morning we're going to begin a new series for a new year called 
new, recognizing that we need to do some things differently this year if we want to grow healthier in our relationships with God and with one another. And so to kick that off, we're going to use Ephesians 5, 15 through 17, where Paul basically says, listen, as you look to the future, you need to proceed with caution. And he gives us some very important lessons that can help us start this new year off right. Well, first of all, Paul tells us that when we take a look at our lives and we think about how we want to live in the days ahead, we need to proceed with caution because, and here's the first thing I want you to write down, our time on earth is limited. My time on earth is limited. Now, I realize that, that this is something that we know. I realize that, that it's a little bit of a given that our time on earth is, is limited, but it, we don't live that way, do we, a lot of times. Psalm 39, 4 says, Show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let, let me know how fleeting is my life. And then Psalm 90.10 says, the length of our days is 70 years, or 80, if we have the strength. They quickly pass and we fly away. Now I realize that for some of us, 70 or 80 years, that sounds like a long, long time. But the reality is, the older we get, the more relative the idea of a long time becomes. For example, for teenagers in love, talking together in, in a car... Uh, you know, an hour or two seems like the blink of an eye. Do you guys remember that? You remember how quickly time passed? But for mom and dad worrying about what's going on out in that car, an hour or two seems like an eternity. Would you agree with me on that, parents? So there's a reminder here from Paul. He, he says our time is limited. There's also a reminder that when we realize how limited our time is, that's going to help us live a little more wisely in the time that we do have. A few years ago, I told you about a website uh, that you could use to calculate the exact date you would die based on your age, your height, your weight, you know, and a bunch of other factors. Well, it was really surprising how many of you were interested in that. And, and, uh, and I remember a lot of people going to that website and putting in their information and being interested to know exactly what day they were supposed to die. Well, if that's not depressing enough for you, the sharper image, with the creator of all things good, uh, has come up now. They sell now something called the Timesis Life Clock. I, I want to make sure I get that right so you guys can go out and buy one of these, okay? The Timesis Life Clock, it sits on your office desk or, or your bedside table, kind of like an alarm clock. And it, I, it's shaped sort of like a, like a, a, a pyramid or the... A Star Wars Death Destroyer, I'm not really sure why it's shaped like that. But anyway, it, it actually, it, like a little alarm clock, once you put in your information, it counts down your remaining time on earth. In hours, think about this, sitting on your nightstand, in hours, in minutes, in seconds, and let's be punctual about this, tenths of seconds, I guess nobody wants a tardy corpse, right? I mean, you want to you wanna know down to the tenth of a second exactly when you're going to die. Now, it, again, if you're interested in this, the life clock, this is a real thing, the life clock costs $99.95, and so far, about 40,000 of these things have been sold at sharperimage.com, so be sure to get yours while supplies last, all right? And, and by the way, one of the most frequently asked questions about the life clock is what happens at the moment the time actually runs out, right? And, you know, does it buzz? Does it play harp music? Or, you know, what exactly happens? Well, the manufacturers say that's a trade secret. you got to buy the clock to find out. So, anyway, if anybody buys that, please let me know. I'd be interested to know how it works out. Personally, as I look at that, I think $100 is a little too much to pay for something so depressing. But it is sort of an intriguing idea. In fact, that's exactly what the psalmist tells us to do. If you think about the two verses I just read to you, that is almost exactly what the psalmist says we need to do. We need to number our days. So if, think about it, if I live to be 75 years old, I have about 12,775 days left to live at this point. That's what my life clock would say. But wait a minute. I don't have a guarantee of even one more day to live, do I? In fact, the Bible tells us not to count on tomorrow because tomorrow may not come for you and for me. All we know, all we have is right now. 
And so this year, we need to live each day like it is valuable because our time on earth is limited. Secondly, Paul tells us that because the days are evil, we must make the most of every opportunity. And let me encourage you to write that word down. Make the most of every opportunity. Jesus said that Satan is a robber and a thief. And, and one of the things that he tries to rob from us is our time. Because time is a very precious possession. Now just think of the time in our life wasted in sinning. Think of the time wasted in wishing that we had more. Think of the time wasted in complaining about what we do have. Think of the time wasted in gossiping or in spreading rumors or in getting even inside our head. Think about all the time wasted worrying about the consequences of the sins that we've committed. Satan is a thief and a robber. But this new year, we need to see that it's not just sin that makes demands on our time. Sometimes even good things can make demands on us. The textbook example of this is the time that Jesus went to the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, friends of his. He sat down to teach and Mary, his friend, was sitting at his feet just sort of soaking in every word. Meanwhile, Martha was out in the kitchen preparing dinner. And if you remember the story, Martha gets upset because Mary's not in the kitchen as well. Mary's not there helping her. And so she complains to Jesus. This is Luke 10, verse 40. She says, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. In verse 41, Mark, Jesus answers, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, was Martha committing a sin by fixing a meal in the kitchen? No, of course not. But here's the problem. She was so preoccupied with what she was doing that she didn't realize that God was in her living room. Now listen, that's the same mistake that you and I make every day of our life, is it not? We get so caught up in the here and the now that we fail to deal with the eternal, the things that will last forever and ever and ever. In fact, one of the biggest challenges we face as a church is in dealing with the fact that people are just plain overloaded. Think about it. We are overloaded with commitments in our life. We, we are some of the most committed people in the history of the world. We've committed ourselves to go here and to go there and to take part of this activity and that social function. You've heard me say that in a lot of ways we fill up our lives with so much good that we have a tendency to miss out on what's truly great. We're also overloaded with possessions. You know, if you're like my family, especially at this time of the year, your closets are full and your garages are overflowing. Did you know that the self-storage industry is a $9.3 billion a year industry? Think about that for a second. And that of the 73,000 self-storage units worldwide, 64,000 of them are located in the United States of America. And a whopping 93%... 93% of those units are already full. We are overloaded in the area of possessions. Thirdly, we have an overload in the area of work. Many get up early. We fight traffic, fight with our bosses, fight with our employees in jobs we never liked for less pay than we think we deserve. And why? Because we got to pay for all those possessions that we've accumulated in our life, right? And then... If that weren't enough today, we even have what's called information overload. Now, I typed in, this is always a good way to get a, a sense of, of something. I, I just typed in the word information in Google. You want to guess how many results I got? Four and a half billion. All right, it'd take me a while to read all those articles. Four and a half billion results on the word information. Did you know that a medical doctor today would have to read 220 articles just to keep up with the changes in their profession in just one month's time. 
Now, the information superhighway, uh, the Internet has done incredible things. It's done an incredible job of putting all that information at our fingertips. Like, we've never had it before in the history of the world. But at this point, we don't know what we would do without it. The problem is we can't absorb it all. Right? It's all out there for us. It's just too much. Commitment overload, possession overload, work overload, and even information overload in our lives. There are so many demands on our time, so many good things that need to be done. We need to recognize our time on earth is limited. We do want to make the most of every opportunity we have. But listen, there are only 8,760 hours left in this year. And guess what? We've already wasted 83 of them, okay? What are we going to do? Well, this last one sort of sums it all up. We must work really hard this year, number three, to gain God's perspective on our time. Would you agree with me? That's the most important thing we can do in this coming year. Gain His perspective. Listen again to Paul's words in Ephesians 5.17. Do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Now let me ask you a question. What do you think God's will is for you in this new year? Do you think He wants your mind so saturated with worries and anxieties that you can't think spiritual thoughts? Do you think He wants your calendar so crowded that you don't have time for the important things? What do you think God's will is for you in 2015? Well, let me suggest that the first thing you're going to have to do is establish your priorities. Now, I'm assuming that since you're in church this morning, that you believe God should at least be a part of your life. But remember that we said we're trying to gain God's perspective on our life this new year. So if you're looking at this from His perspective, where do you think He wants to be placed on your list of priorities? It's not too hard to figure out. God always wants to be number one in your life. So number one, it's got to be God. There's no doubt. Number one in your family's life. Number one in the life of a church. Number one in the life of a nation. Always number one. That is where God belongs. So if you're willing to approach this year from His perspective, you got to put God at the top of that list of priorities and say, He's going to affect my decisions. He's going to affect my scheduling. He's going to affect my relationships with other people. He's going to affect my whole outlook on life. Everything I do and say and think needs to be affected and impacted by Him. This means that worship is going to be a priority for me. Sunday mornings are my most important opportunity to worship God. Not my only opportunity, but the most important opportunity for you, for your family, for your church family. So you know what? That may, af that may affect how we do things on Saturday night. Have you ever thought about that? I I'm going to make my plans on Saturday night so that that impacts what happens to me, how I feel what my availability is, what my attitude is on Sunday morning. Some of you are looking at me with this funny, strange look on your face right now. You can do it. You can do it. It's going to impact the way that you approach the days in your life and how you worship your Heavenly Father. It may impact what you do on Wednesdays or Sunday afternoons when you say, I want to make sure to the best of my ability that God is my priority. That means that uh, my relationships with other Christians have to become a priority for me as well. Community group, if I have one, takes on an increasingly significant role in my life. And if I don't have one, is there a better time of the year to find one than right now, the beginning of 2015? We've got some great community groups that meet at 945 on Sunday morning. There's one for you. Go find a community group. Get involved. Get to know people on a deeper level. If God is number one, then that means that discipleship has got to be a priority for me. Growing in my knowledge of and my relationship with the God who gives me each day of my life. We're going to start a new Bible study this Wednesday night. We have dinner at 5. 
at 6, the, the children uh, have activities upstairs, the youth are across the street, and the adults are beginning a new Bible study called uh, Understanding the New Testament. It's a great study. It's sort of a bird's eye view of the New Testament. It gives you a good sense of, of how things are connected in the New Testament, and what's going on. It'd be great for someone, maybe who hasn't studied the Bible a lot. I promise you it'll be great for somebody who knows the Bible well. You're going to learn some things you never knew about the New Testament. And that begins this, this uh, Wednesday night. We'd love to have you come and be a part of that. You don't have to buy anything. You show up. Uh, when you can be there, you come and you participate with us. And when you have other obligations and you have to miss, it's okay. This is the kind of study you can get started in. We want to encourage you to come and be a part of that. These are just a few of the ways that putting God first in our priority list can impact the way that we live our life this new year. There's a second priority that needs to be made, and that is family. Our family. From God's perspective... Our family is our most important responsibility. But you know, a strong, healthy, godly family doesn't happen by accident. Are you aware of that? It happens as you make the tough choices, as you make the difficult sacrifices necessary to build a godly foundation for your home. I want to encourage you to make an investment of time with your family this year. And I want to challenge you to take advantage of the tools and the resources offered here at Oakdale. Listen, you have the opportunity not only to receive resources, but also the opportunity to be a resource for our community, for the places where we minister in the coming year. Make sure that family is high on your list of priorities this year. And then the third one that I want to mention is, and it sort of depends here, but it's work and school, and look, if, if you don't have to go to work, I realize I look across the, the congregation this morning, you know, some of us don't have to go to work or to school. Here's what I want you to do. Sometimes I'll have, you know, don't send me emails on Monday morning, okay, and be like, you know what, that doesn't even apply to me. I don't know what that, I don't have to do that. Listen, don't do that. Instead, take your pen, take your pencil, and just draw a big smiley face right next to that. <laughs> Maybe with the tongue sticking out like, okay. You know, you got to work, you got to go to school, I don't have to. Just do that and then we'll all be happy with this, all right? But most of us have to go to work. Most of us have to go to school. So don't you think it makes sense that Christians ought to be the best workers and students that can be found in the world? Yes or no? We've got some teachers in here. Don't you feel like that Christian students ought to be the best students that you teach? We have Christian employers. Don't you think the best employees you have ought to be Christians? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. And that means that, that when someone hires a Christian, they ought to know they're getting someone who's going to give them an honest day's work and not cheat them. That when they go to work for a Christian employer, that they're going to work for someone who will treat them fairly and will provide a godly environment in which they work. That when they teach a Christian student, they can expect someone who gives their best effort and takes care of their academic responsibilities every single time. You see, because we're Christians, we have a responsibility to God to honor Him, even in the marketplace, even in our school. Listen, if we just changed just this one thing about ourselves... That would make a major difference in how we live for God in this new year. So to, to sort of recap, recognize that your time on earth is limited. Commit yourself to making the most of every single opportunity that God gives you. Take God's perspective on your time and allow these things to shape your priorities for a new year. Now, let's, let's be honest. Year after year, Many of us have been making resolutions, making promises to God and to ourselves that this year we're going to do things differently. Year after year, convincing ourselves that if we could just make it through this struggle, if we can just overcome that bad habit, if we could just wait until this crisis has passed, it's all going to be okay. Maybe it's time for us to stop worrying about all that's happened in our past. Stop counting on the things that are coming in the future and start living for God right now, today. There's a story told about a, a girl who spent her entire childhood waiting for college. 
But when she finally got to college, she, she didn't enjoy it. And so she told herself, if I can ever get out of college and get married and have children, I know I'll finally be able to enjoy my life. So she stuck with it. She went to classes every day, and finally she graduated from college. And then she got married, and she had children. And she discovered that children are a lot of work, right? And so she, she, she told herself, you know, if I can just get these kids raised... Then I'll be able to relax and really enjoy life. A prayer I pray on a daily basis, okay? But about, about the time, her mother's not here, so I don't have to worry. I only have to worry about her, and she'll keep her mouth shut, right? Right, baby? Right, sweetheart? <laughs> by, by the time the kids were entering high school, her husband said, guess what? We don't have enough money to send our kids to college. I guess you're going to have to, to get a job. Well, she didn't want to, but she knew it was right, and they needed the money, and so she went to work, and she hated it. But she told herself, if I can just get these kids out of college, if I could just get the bills paid, how many times have, have we said these kind of things in our life? Then I can quit work, I can quit my job, and, and I can really enjoy life. And finally, the last child graduated from college, and all the bills were paid, and so she walked into her employer's office and she said, today's the day, I quit. And he said, oh, you don't want to quit now. If you stay with us just another eight years, you'll have pension for the rest of your life. And she thought, well, I don't want to work another eight years, but there's all that money there. If I, I really can't turn down the opportunity. And so she worked for another eight years. Finally, she and her husband retired at the same time. They sold their home and they bought a little retirement cottage. And they sat down on the swing on their front porch and they looked at their family picture album and they dreamed about the good old days, right? John Lennon said in a song, life is what happens to you while you're making plans to do something else. It's true, isn't it? Another year has come and gone. A new year stretches out before us. Help us, Lord, to redeem the time. Help us use the 8,760 hours of this year the wisest way we can for you, God, and for your glory. Romans 13, 11 through 12 says this, The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here, so let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Heavenly Father, as we think about this new year that stretches out before us, we can't help but think about past years. God, we can't help but think about the time that we've wasted in, in sin, wasted in things that were not helpful, not healthy, not beneficial, but God also wasted in things that were good, but just not great. We can't help but think about the past. God, we can't help but look forward to the future. We can't help but hope that the future will be better, that when we finally get to this place or that place in our life, we'll finally be satisfied. But God, we know that's not how it works. We know that once we get there, we'll only look back to these days and long for the simpler times. God, what we need to be focused on is right here and right now and how we live for you and how we relate to you. And so, Father, as we begin 2015, I pray that you would help us inside our own heart and mind to reestablish our set of priorities and put you at the top and love you above everything else and let you and your relationship with us impact everything that we do. Father, for those who don't know you, those who are here this morning, and maybe they're searching, maybe they are struggling, and God, I just pray that, that you would draw them close to you today. Show them that you can give them life like they've never had before. You can give them eternity that they could never dream of. But God, first, they have to place their hearts and their lives in your hand and surrender themselves to you. 
God, I pray that every single one of us would walk away this morning with, with a new sense of surrender to you, recognizing how important it is that we allow you to lead us into this new year. God, I love you. I trust you for the days ahead. I trust you for right now. And I know that you're going to give us the strength that we need. We love you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.